it's great to be here. Uh, I probably saw a lot of you last time uh, in 2010 when we were fighting against Prop 23. Um, let me take a little bit of time just to talk about what we were trying to do in 23 and why it's relevant in 2012. Um, we did get more votes voting against that proposition than any candidate in the United States got that night or than any other proposition got. <laughs> and, and honestly, my co-chair, George Schultz, who is 91 years old, spent the entire campaign, as far as I can remember, saying to me, Tom, we really have to smash these people. But the truth is, for me, there were different important things to be gotten from that uh, campaign. The first one is, it's not just the number of votes you get, it's how salient they are to the voters. Because if you want to change votes, you have the elected officials have to believe that the voters care about that specific issue. And in that campaign, the sitting Republican governor was on our side. The woman who was running for governor as a Republican was on our side. And the reason that was true is that 85% of the people who voted with us said it was very important to them or somewhat important to them. And that's really a measure of salience. It, and that's the thing that actually moves the needle with elected officials. The other thing that I think really changed in 23, and I want to get around to what we hope to, how we hope to build on it in 2012, is that we had a very different coalition from the traditional environmental coalition. The traditional framework in California and around the United States for environmental arguments is environmentalists against business people and jobs. And that is a complete loser for us. That is a framework which in the past when it happens, and particularly at a time when the nation is struggling so much and there are so many people out of work, that is not a framework where you're gonna, pa where you're gonna win. The truth is if you look at our proposition coalition, we had more than half of the chambers of commerce. We were explicitly bipartisan. But more than that, we had the NAACP, we had the Latino Chamber of Commerce, we had the Ella Baker Center, so that we really had a completely different face to that proposition than the way that people traditionally think about environmentalism. But more important than that, with all those other people, were the people in this room. You know, the working people of California very much supported this, this fight against 23. Um, and the reason, one of the big reasons they did is we made the argument successfully that we're about the economic future of the state. And I think Californians, at least since 1849, have believed that the future was something that they could grab onto, and they believed in 2010 that the future of new ways of doing energy was gonna create new businesses, new jobs, and was gonna make the state a lot more prosperous. And that is something that we believed then, and I still believe now, and that's really what I'm up here to talk to you about today. Um, because this is obviously, energy is just a huge business in our economy. In terms of what's thought of as advanced energy or clean energy, Bloomberg keeps track of how much money is invested in it. There's been a, over a trillion dollars invested in it in spite of the fact that we don't have a global climate bill. Um, and the United States is really leading the way. I think there was a lot of concern that we would stop, that we wouldn't push forward on this, but actually in 2011, we grew by 35% in terms of the money spent in clean energy. China grew by 1%. In terms of where we are globally, the United States has always led at every single stage of energy technology and energy advance. That is true today, that's got to be true going forward, and it's something which is gonna, this is a, something that it should both make a lot of money for the country and put a lot of people to work here. And more than that, in terms of advanced energy, the state that leads the way overwhelmingly is California, we have seven out of the 10 top clean tech companies. We have five times more money invested here in clean tech last year than the next biggest state. The next biggest state is Massachusetts. We are 5X. We're by far the biggest in terms of putting in residential and utility grade solar, and we're number two to Texas in the area. So 
there are a lot of things that this space is pushing on hard in terms of advanced energy. And it's something where I think the momentum, we, we can do much better than this, and I'm here to talk about what we can do better. But I do want to acknowledge the fact that we are in a leadership position, and it's something where it's been significant for the state so far. You know, the Blue-Green Alliance has a report that talks about some of the policies that make it possible for the state to be so successful. And they involve energy efficiency standards, school, specific school-related policies, and smart grid technology. When I think about what it takes for the state and the country to excel in advanced energy, it's really three things. We need the new technology, we need policies, and we need money. And all three of those things are necessary for us to go forward, and sometimes one or the other of them falls by the wayside for a while. So for instance, in California, one of my big disappointments, in many ways I thought 2011 was a very good year for advanced energy, but last year um, we didn't renew the public goods charge, which was basically money coming out of utility bills for research for advanced energy in California. And that's something that's been around for a while. It's proved to have an enormous impact on creating companies and creating jobs. There was really very little doubt about how effective and important this money was. It's about $400 million a year. It's really research money. And it didn't get renewed. And Lisa told me just this afternoon that uh, in fact, she was very hopeful that this is something that will come back, and I'm hopeful that that's in fact true. But we have to keep moving regardless of what our elected officials do at any one time. And this is obviously a time when both the state legislature and our national congress are having issues about getting things done, but that shouldn't affect the rest of us in terms of pushing forward and making sure that we continue the momentum, that we, in terms of money, technology, and policy, we provide the tools to the extent we can to make sure that we do the next thing and that we stay in the loop. Um, some friends of mine published something called the California Bright Spot, which highlights some of the good stuff. So let me just, in the last few weeks, they basically talk about good things that are happening in advanced energy in California. So there are things going on in the Housing Authority of Santa Barbara, the Monterey Airport, it's very widespread. My favorite article from the last two weeks is there's something called the Musco Family Olive Oil Company, which has taken their 15 tons of olive pits and used it to uh, drive the largest industrial steam engine in California. So if people are taking their olive pit and turning that into energy in the largest steam engine here, that is the kind of thing that's going to go on in the United States. We are, if we have the right policies, if we enable people around here, then every nut in the world is going to come up with a new idea. And some of those nuts are gonna turn out to be named Thomas Edison or Ford. And so really what we're doing as a society is pervasive and it's something which, if we do our jobs right, we will see enormous changes. A and on a broad base, you know, not a directed change, but a very broad base dispersed way. You know, from my point of view, we're the Saudi Arabia of advanced energy. But we're the Saudi Arabia of advanced energy because of the people of California. You know, this is not about us having specifically natural resources. This is about us having human capital in a variety of places. Th these numbers are always a little hard to understand for me, but we definitely have 35,000 people in the solar industry in this state, and the State Department of uh, Economic Development measures 500,000 green energy jobs in the state. That is a lot of jobs. And if we're really growing this at the kind of rate I'm talking about, that can take up a lot of slack in a labor market that is very unpleasant and has been very unpleasant now for several years. So even though the policy environment isn't assured going forward, certainly not in terms of the state legislature or the Congress of the United States, 
Let me talk a little bit about what I've been trying to do and what we can work on together going forward to try and make sure that the overall environment is one where we'll continue to grow these businesses, put people to work in good ways. One of the things that came out of 23 was the question of what arguments in terms of advanced energy were meaningful to normal people. Because I think there's always been a sense that for some reason this was gonna be an environmental argument. And in co-chairing that campaign, I spent a lot of time looking at polls to hear what people actually cared about. What were the arguments that they heard that were relevant to them? And one of the arguments that was true was it's about health. If, if you talk about environmentalism to normal citizens, the way that it translates for them is the health of themselves, their families, and the people that they know. And that is a way of understanding in 23, we used a lot of ads where there were smokestacks and we were talking about people's asthma, all of which was true. And that was something that people could really relate to and the people who talked about it and joined with us on it were the American Lung Association. And the reason that that was important was people know the American Lung Association cares about air pollution and they know they care about people's ability to breathe because they've been working on it for 30 or 40 years. So that was a way of expressing what we wanted to get done in a way that people could hear. But the other major argument that we made that people could hear was about jobs. Because we were basically trying to take it out of that frame of jobs or the environment, which I've always said is like saying to someone, have you stopped eating your wife? There's no good answer if your choice is either have a healthy planet or have employed citizens. That is a false choice, and it's also one which seems to me to be inherently negative no matter which way you turn. What we said was we can get business people to come out and talk about the kinds of businesses we can create, talk about the kinds of jobs we can create, and if we do that, we negate that whole argument from the other side. And that was something where it really worked. And as a result, I came out of that campaign and basically tried, started trying to build business groups in every state of the United States that would be organized around the idea of advanced energy. That they would be trying to create ecosystems like California, where a combination of policymakers, business people, investors, and researchers in universities would create kind of a cluster of innovation where businesses could grow up and go to work and where different kinds of companies work together and compete with each other to you know, build a new part of the economy. That is something which we've been working on now for about a year. It seems to be going pretty well. We probably have organizations that cover 10 states and we hope to be organized in 25 states by the time of the election. Um, you know, when it comes to politics, one of my favorite uh, cliches or old sayings is, if you're not at the table, that means you're on the menu. <laughs> and it's really true in energy. If, there's, if you're not organized to make your case, if you don't have a coalition of people that are trying to get somewhere, that I, I can assure you the other side will be organized. And as a result, the kinds of things that are important to have happen won't happen. Because if there's no organization pushing it, then it really will fail. That's one thing I've been working on. And the other one, which is the thing that I think is most relevant today, is something called the California Clean Energy Jobs Act. This is really a continuation in many ways of the No on Prop 23 campaign. We're hoping to get back together the coalition that worked together so well in 2010. You know, everyone in, the, in this group keeps saying, we're gonna get the band back together. You know, the classic, uh, you know, we're going to get in the garage and try and remember how to play a date. But this, let me just quickly outline for you what this proposition is going to be. It's going to be different because it's actually a yes instead of a no. And we all know it's much, e it's much harder to pass a proposition than to prevent a proposition. But this starts, there are basically three parts to this proposition. The first one is... We want to change, we want to close a loophole for out-of-state companies. Out-of-state companies do not pay state income tax on their income in the state of California, which is often their biggest competition. 
that is something which has been true only since 2009. The legislature has tried to undo it unsuccessfully so far, and it's worth about a, b a billion one to, to the uh, state of California every year. So that is something where every California-based company will pay this tax. If you move your company to Reno, Nevada, you don't pay the tax, which seems completely crazy to me. And in fact, we think we've lost something like 40,000 jobs in the state of California to people who've done just that. So what are we going to do with the money? A about 55% of the money is earmarked for the first five years to doing retrofits. And it's basically an energy efficiency thing where we're going to use the money to retrofit state office buildings, universities, and schools. That's the biggest thing we're going to do. And that's a question of there's no doubt that we have the technology to make these good investments for the state. The, the payback on this kind of work is usually three to five years. The problem is we usually, it, it, I, I know it's hard to believe in the state of California that we don't have the money to do it, but we don't have the money to do it. And this is specifically, we call it the Clean Energy Jobs Act because the, these are very construction oriented, manufacturing oriented jobs. You know, this is stuff which is the very people who have been laid off in the construction trades, this is exactly the kind of thing we need. It's HVAC systems, it's new kinds of glass, it's sensors. There's a, the technology here is done. In fact, I went and checked just before coming down here. Um, specifically, it has to be by, done by companies that are located in California. And that is actually about a little, 55% of the money. The other 45% of the money is going to go to the schools. Um, that is by law, but the way that we look at it is this is basically, there are three parts to this, to this uh, proposition, and they're all wins for the state of California. We get to close a loophole on out-of-state corporations. So that is money coming to California that should be here, that hasn't for uh, some messed up legislative reason, is not coming here right now, so that's new money for us. A lot of it is the jobs part and the energy part of retrofitting these buildings and doing the training that's necessary for workers to be able to do that work efficiently. And then the third part of it is money for the schools. This is something which absolutely seems straightforward to me. I can't really understand anyone who would be against this in the state of California. I can understand if you're selling, making a lot of money selling things in California to Californians, and you're out of state, you might not want to pay your fair share, but I'm not particularly disposed to feel kindly to that idea. Um, it, right now, we are out getting signatures. We think we'll have enough signatures somewhere it, between April 15th and April 30th, and it'll be on the ballot in November. So, <laughs> I, I, we are very serious about trying to make this the next step of the No on Prop 23 campaign, to build on the coalition and to make sure that people understand it's a continuation of that. But let me make one last point before I um, sit down. And this is one which I feel incredibly strongly about in terms of where we stand in energy. And as Lisa was saying, I'm a, an investor. I spend, I've spent the last 30 years thinking about how um, private companies make money, looking at economies around the world. We're actually on four continents, not three continents. And the overwhelming fact of my life for the last 30 years in thinking about how companies are going to do is globalization. The world is much, much smaller, certainly from 30 years ago, but it gets smaller every day. And our ability to exist outside the competition from the rest of the world, which I think 30 years ago, there were many places where you could hide. Now I don't think there are any places where you can hide. And if there are, they'll be gone by tomorrow. But I also feel as if energy is maybe our biggest opportunity as a group in terms of business, in terms of jobs. And let me talk about that for one second before I sit down. And I think our existing energy policy is one path that we've been on for a long time. And if I were going to describe what it is, I would say 
our energy policy is we want the cheapest possible energy regardless of how much it costs us. And I know that seems crazy, but it is a crazy policy. <laughs> and, you know, I, the costs that we don't include are health costs for citizens. I mean, I literally was talking to someone who was arguing with me about coal and saying, you can't include the health costs. It's kind of like, we, the c people go to the hospital. They do get sick. You've got to include that. Someone is paying those costs. They don't include environmental costs. And, you know, the other cost that's in there that people never talk about is the defense costs of having gasoline be available at the cheapest price. And those are, <laughs> you know, th those are the costs that we are paying all the time and never thinking about. And, y you know, that to me is crazy business. I I if you're a, an investor, what you really want is to have full cost accounting. And, and really that's something where I think we need to go. But I think the other thing that's true is we've been really, really short-sighted in thinking about energy. In the sense that every time energy costs go down, we have a new policy. And you know, most of these decisions are 10-year decisions, 20-year decisions, 50-year decisions. So we really have to think about energy in our society as a port, I hate to sound like an investor, so I'll apologize because it's pretty boring, but it's a portfolio. You know, you can't put all your eggs in a portfolio into one basket, and particularly in energy because the price of the basket changes so much. You know, we've seen, get, you know, uh, oil prices at 40 bucks, and now they're at 120 bucks, and that's all in the last few years. They really move around. So you have to have a portfolio so that you don't get killed when they move around against you. So that's one big point. What, that, what does that really mean? It really means two things to me right now. One is we can't give up on alternative energy, on advanced energy, if, there's, if something else is cheaper momentarily. We need to keep doing the work and pushing these new technologies and make sure we lead because you can be sure the prices of natural resources will change. That is the absolute given. They absolutely will change. And in addition, I think it's been since 1952 that Eisenhower said, don't rely on imported oil, and of course, we rely on imported oil. It's a big mistake. We can do this ourselves. It will be incredibly good for the United States if we do in a number of ways, including the fact that we'll build a lot of companies and put a lot of people to work. But the second thing that I think is incredibly powerful for us right now, and that is incredibly powerful for all the people who put their hands up as being part of the labor movement, and that's this. We have a domestic power source natural gas where the price is incredibly cheap. And it's incredibly cheap because we've discovered we have so much more of it than we ever knew. And if you think about energy, it's just a commodity. You know, the, 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 met the unit of measurement is the BTU, the British Thermal Unit. And you can compare every single energy source on a BTU basis. So natural gas right now is the equivalent to oil of about $14 a barrel. Oil is $120 a barrel. One of the biggest costs in our economy, there are two huge costs that flow through our economy. The price of money, which the Federal Reserve sets, and every time, you know, that's basically how the government tries to push our economy. They lower the cost of money and they expect the economy to boom. The other huge cost in our economy is energy. And if we're in a global economy and we can create energy, at a fraction of what other people are creating it for, we can compete really successfully in a whole bunch of businesses where we're not sure we can compete anymore. And we're seeing it now, we're seeing chemical businesses come back. This flows all the way through manufacturing, every manufacturing business. To actually enable ourselves to take advantage of this would be an enormous building project. This would dwarf the highway project of the 50s, where we basically push highways all over the United States for many years. So the biggest thing that I'm really up here that I'm, I was saying to some of the people earlier today, I'm crazy on this topic because this is something that can transform us economically. It can, tran can transform us from a job standpoint in terms of our competitiveness. And the other thing is it's we have to do it responsibly. I'm looking at Carl Pope. I know there are huge environmental issues with this. So what it really says is we need leadership that insists 
that this be done in a way that we preserve our environment and specifically we are very careful about greenhouse gases. This is something, it's technologically driven, but I, about 10 minutes ago I said to you, we've led every energy technology for over 100 years in this country. We are the best, we have the best resources. We have to do research, we have to develop technology, we have to insist on that. But if we do it, I think we're in a completely different place economically. I think we have a completely different profile looking forward in terms of jobs. And I think our ability to export this around the world and change the trajectory of how we're handling the physical environment completely can change. So I don't want to say that our proposition is to lead on to that grandiose statement, but I do hope you'll support us on the proposition, and it is part of a bigger vision of what I think we all can do together. Thank you very much.